Hey, Overwatch community, and welcome to Watchpoint, the channel where we're going to discuss anything evol evolving over the scene of Overwatch up until release. And currently in beta, you know, through stress tests and stuff like that, that some people still aren't in because we're just that unlucky. Uh, joining me again on our second cast, I'm going to have Yiska. Hello. And Volcha. Hello. And today's topic, we're going to be talking about the UI in Overwatch. Anything from while you're playing the game. And uh, they've actually started having tournaments for a game that is still in beta. That's only been in beta for maybe a month. Um, <laughs> but we're going to talk about the spectator point of view for the UI as well. But let's start off with the in-game player UI. Uh, what do you like? What don't you like? What... Besides, obviously, a kill feed needs to be added into this UI. Well, um, first of all, I think um, Blizzard has a tendency to go like overboard with the flashy stuff in their in their games. Um, they sort of it's kind of their style. Uh, they sort of take the approach. Um, to style that a 12-year-old girl would take to putting on makeup, um, which is just cake it on, and it looks good. So um, there's a lot of stuff that I think might not work for this type of game, a high-action game, which is uh, big weapon models, big uh, muzzle flashes, um, large particle effects. It can work in like games which aren't centered on action, like uh, card games or or um, RPG games, because it adds excitement there. But when you're in a uh, first-person game, the excitement is what you're doing in the first-person game. And if, it, if the art style is taken away from it, that might be a problem. And in my opinion, um, there's some things taken away from it. Yeah, I think the scale of the ult... I don't think that they should take away all of it, but definitely the scale of, like, uh, some of the ultimates just, you know huge black holes and explosions and stuff like that it can get very very cluttered as well as just when your alt up it's glowing on the screen and when you're on fire your uh, character portrait thing underneath it is glowing and there's just a lot of effects going on and it, I mean it's, it, it's distracting somewhat it's weird in a way that some ultimates seem to be so over the top and while other ultimates, like McCree's, for instance, is almost invisible in the sense that, okay, you can hear the sound, kind of glows too, but you, I don't think you have any uh, real indication if, if he hits something, really, or, you know, you would think there's like a bullet travel or something, or a yeah, like flash or something. Yeah, like smoke trails or something like that. Yeah, but yeah. even though there might be a little bit, I'm not 100% sure on that, it doesn't seem to be enough for people... Um, in a spectator environment to be able to tell uh, who made the kill there. yeah. And with the other ults, if you think of Farah, for instance, it's blatantly obvious where the damage is coming from, right? Yeah, but I feel like Farah's ult, to be honest, isn't that flashy. It's a bunch of rockets, but it's not like, you know, it's not like she's firing a laser beam. Like, uh, I hate I hate pronouncing her name. Is it Zen? Is it? Z Zarya? Yeah, Zarya. Her her black hole ultimate is just it takes up like half of the screen of glowing particles. It's not like it's just one little black hole and there's like a gravity swirl around it. It's huge. Yeah. You can't even see the character models within the black hole. You just see the outlines, the you know, after effect outlines that they add and the health bars. That's all you see. Yeah. I think <laughs> there might actually be also the advantages of playing low uh on every setting. Because I never really, while playing, I, that didn't seem like too big of a problem. Because Zarya ult, if that is cast, 90% of the time, this is the core of the action right now, right? Yeah. Like, she you, she should be using it never on less than three targets, I, I guess. Or yeah. two I targets mean, might be okay, yeah. In pubs, and that's not what we're talking about, because they don't balance, they don't change mm. anything for pubs. But if you're in a comp team or ranked or something... Nobody's just gonna throw it out to throw it out. They're gonna yeah. use it when it's necessary. But still, it you know it blocks a lot. Can we think of? I mean, <clears throat> Reinhardt? No, he just kind of smashes the ground and it cracks. And yeah, uh, I mean Reaper, he's kind of flashy, but it's just around his body, really. 
the thing is, if you think about it, Farah Ult Ultimate and uh, Reinhardt, in a way, is exactly the type of uh, visuals we should have. Yeah. Because they're not too flashy. Like, that, that should be the benchmark, kind yeah. of. Yeah. I and, agree with that, yeah. And, yeah, I don't, it's, it's mostly like someone went too hard on the Skittles <laughs> most of the time in Blizzard <laughs> games. Like, it tastes... It's, Taste it's the definitely rainbow. their style. Boys? They they love the porny graphics. They porn up all the all that stuff. Yeah. I mean, if you look at uh, Hearthstone, <clears throat> the whole menu is just like a three D object that like moves and rotates and pops pops um, lights out and uh, screaming dwarves. Um, even the you know, it's even the game boards themselves. Like, there's ones that have like pools of lava that you can drain and like stuff like that. Like, it's just a simple yeah. card game. They love that stuff, Blizzard. Um, it seems like they really are took that philosophy and put it in this game, and yeah, it seems to be causing some problems. I mean, the community seems to be voicing unanimous, unanimously about muzzle flash, um, weapon model size, and um, some ultimates. This what they take up on the screen. The, yeah. the thing is, some stuff like the weapon model size, for instance. I, I read a good argument about this being a console thing, basically. Like, that they are going to have an option or going to turn it down for the PC version. And I can't see this being uh, reality. And now they just want to get the client out. Because obviously, it's uh, a little different for consoles, the, the update uh, frequency and um, PC. Wouldn't, wouldn't that affect competitive play, though? In what sense? What if do you, mean? you can hide your uh, gun models, I guess it would be like the options there for everybody. But if you, I know there's some like TF2 mods and stuff where you can just hide everything but the crosshair. So if for some reason you're looking up like straight up in the air or like at an angle and someone comes right into your field of view where your weapon model would be blocking normally, having that turned off gives you that extra bit of screen space to see. Yeah. I'm not yeah. sure if, if you should be able to turn it off, but definitely scale it down or they should have, have it by default. In general, a competitive game probably wants as much, as much customization as you can get. Like if you think about it, like there's a, almost a cult following uh, for CSGO players, like their configs and... Oh, yeah. You know, just, but just what, now... But that's what Steam is known for. Steam's known for like, <laughs> hey guys, here's our game, have fun, like just changing everything about it whereas besides wow i i don't think can you change much about i mean they only have other what heroes and that's not even that competitive they're not you can't touch any of that hearthstone you can't change anything i think that's yeah. just blizzard baby basically like they don't like their <laughs> stuff to be messed with the thing is that is not true for wow to be fair because well, yeah, of the add-ons and everything right yeah, i mean add-ons are I think that most of the stuff that is add-ons just ends up like Blizzard takes it and puts it into their game. Not mm -hmm. a, not everything, but a lot of things that people have created, Blizzard's like, all right, that's a good idea, um, but we're just going to take it. Like, it's our game, so we're going to take your idea and put it in. Yeah. So like, I think that's a very good thing to do, but it, if you kind of limit the other stuff, then um, on a whole, it's neg it's not as good of an approach as like a wholly open approach. Yeah. But it's still good yeah. <laughs> that I mean, they adopt it. We, we don't really want to, like, I don't think it's necessary in Overwatch to uh, add functionality that gives uh, certain, you know, mods functionality that could give you a, a competitive ad advantage. But what you want really is to be able to, you know, customize your UI, say, for instance, I want my HP on the right top side or something. So do you think right. it'd be easier to solve it rather than doing some like going into the final files, config file or like downloading from a website rather than being like, okay, if you click this button in like a practice mode, then all the like health bars, the alt bar or alt circle, that stuff, it like unlocks and you can just like drag it on a grid and move it that way. Do you think that'd yeah. be better? Yeah. Because that'd be pretty sweet. Because as much as people go, it's not that hard to change a text file and stuff like that, you got to think that it's not all 
20 plus 20 to like 30 people or 20 to 30 year old people like playing this game who are computer you know literate it's i mean there's gonna be 15 year old kids playing this game who in less hours of googling and like trying it themselves like we did when we were younger it's just easier for them to click an option in the game rather mm. than doing all the background file searching and that type of stuff even if they had presets that you could select, like a dozen different UI presets, that would be give more options. Yeah, rather than good. rather than giving you complete reign over you know their UI that they probably meticulously set up, just a couple like I mean even small, medium, and large like. <laughs> yeah. Excuse me. I know in I know in WoW for me, I don't like a large UI. I think it clutters it. So, I usually set my stuff like really small, and I know where it is. And it's it's fine for me. I could see a minimal UI being very popular in the game. I mean, you don't really need the picture of your character on fire taking up, you know, like one tenth of the screen in the corner, and then next to it a giant health bar with health numbers next to the health bar. Um, you don't really need that. Um, no. If you play the game long enough, you're gonna know roughly what's happening with that, all that visual feedback right there. Okay. To throw a curveball into this while I'm thinking of it, do you think that, um, well, I think we talked about this maybe off camera, but do you think that the, say, like 40 out of 40 bullets is necessary? Like it's, what's, it's board what's the point if there's no clips? Yeah, I mean, th exactly. there's, there's clips, but there's not there's not a maximum amount of ammo. Yeah, it's borderline confusing because you would think from all experiences you had in other games that now your total ammunition is these numbers combined, right? Yeah. So you could run out of ammunition. I, I don't even understand why you need to state clip size um, after like a, I don't know. Like it feels like a thing you would give new people so they get to know the clip size, but even then if you want to find out, just reload and you have the full number again and there's not, not currently a character that increases ammunition size based on anything that uh, he interacts with in the game with, so it really feels like, like if you're talking about visual clutter, yeah. obviously it's not a big thing, but it feels unnecessary. A lot of, I mean, it's a lot of the minute stuff that stacks up and it's like, is it necessary? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I just Do think you this, need... the second uh, the second number is what I'm talking about. Obviously, you need to know how many rockets or bullets you have, but that second like total ammo clip is what I'm talking about. But go ahead. It's also I'm wondering if it's necessary to even have the the keys. You know, it says Q, hit Q for ultimate. You know, or mm. hit E for this ability. Um, is that something that we're gonna need for somebody? I, at I least would, played 20 hours, you know? I would argue another option to turn it off, but as someone who just jumps into the game, and I know me, I'm bullheaded, I'm not going to do a boring tutorial because I don't want to be <laughs> spoon-fed. I'm, you know, I know what I'm doing, right? But in the middle of a game and, you know, someone comes up and I'm Reaper and I go, oh, what's my invincibility? And I go, oh, there it is on the screen. I can hit the button. But I think you should be mm. able to turn it off. Yeah, if you think about it, if, if you guys play Counter Strike, there's this thing that keeps popping up if, if something happens to your account or you log into your account again as, after some time, where it switches on like a noob mode, where it tells you, okay, uh, plant the bomb. You know, if the, you have this overlay on your screen, like tips. telling you, yeah, exactly. And if if that was uh, to be in the game and would display the current UI with the keybinds and everything, that would be fine. You could. But if you could switch it off, that would further uh, decrease visual clutter. And even then, you have to say it's not 100% like... If you think, for instance, Tracer, yeah? She can use her shift uh, ability, which is in the shift slot, also with right-click, but there's no UI um, representation of that. Unless you try it when you have your main weapon, or your only weapon for Tracer, yeah. um, you wouldn't know. Like... And at that point, if you're not even displaying the full uh, information where your keybinds are, well, might as well not display it at all. Or, I don't know, because it feels, at least to me, a lot more intuitive to use right-click for this dash move. And it feels quicker 
you need to be quick with tracer than using shift in that situ situation. Do you think that the like uh, the dashes in the middle of the screen are necessary, or do you think they could be shoved off to the side like over the ability? I actually quite like that in a sense. I don't know if the size is uh, correct. I mean, you could weave it maybe into the crosshair if you wanted to. Yeah, but like after, after what you know, twenty games as tracer, someone who's trying to like improve at tracer, they know they have three, like, and yeah. mentally they're gonna know. I I mean, I don't know offhand, but how fast they recharge. Yeah, but then again, Overwatch tends to be a game where you really misjudge time. Yeah. Like um it sure that and that could turn into a skill, but um I think to intuitively be able to judge how many charges you have right now, and this can be we we, we have seen situations where you can't cannot get to a position where you only have two charges right now, you need three. Right? That's like basic movement tricks right now all re revolve around Tracer being able to use three. If you have only have two, you fail the jump. So you need some kind of indication. If it needs to be below the crosshair, I don't know, but you need it on your UI, I'm pretty sure. Okay. I know now they have a, um, like it's a subtle audio cue for when it comes up. It kind of like does a little squeak. Um, if they made that stronger, do you think that would help that? Or do mm. you think it just wouldn't matter? It might intuitively uh, like help you a little bit. But then again, like I'm right now probably let's say in the second tier of MMR, yeah? Not not in the absolute top players in Europe, but I think below that. You're and I sometimes you're have yourself that much credit. <laughs> 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 yeah, I don't so let's say I I've seen a lot of people who've played in the European tournaments on a regular basis when I play. Yeah. And um like the sound cues don't, still don't feel uh, intuitive to me. The steps might. I can tell which characters are uh, moving, like next to me and everything. That's fine. But sometimes it re gets really cluttered in a sense that you don't 100% know if it's your Farah ulting or their Farah ulting. It's um, <clears throat> if it's. Um, but wait, you know, it doesn't like, like when Junkrat, when he, you know. Uh, I can't remember the exact quote, but when he yells and you hear the tire go off, isn't your team quieter in, like, the opposite team is, like, extremely loud in comparison? It, that might be the case, but then again, you would think that has something to do with distance, right? That yeah. doesn't feel intuitive at all yeah. to me. Much like what also doesn't feel intuitive to me is the damage indications you get, which currently is around the crosshair. It's like little red blips. I had to really learn those because th those aren't uh, used in any FPS I've played so far. Are you talking about like uh, like hit markers? Like yeah. Like, so like you know the Call of Duty like X thing. Do you know what I'm talking? I about? think he's talking it's, about when when you get hit. When, when you, you get, get hit. hit. Oh, yeah. when you get hit. Okay. Yeah. And sometimes like it took real practice to be able to tell where it's coming from. Like you you. I noticed because of the sound before I noticed because of the indication. Because in CS, for instance, your entire right frame side yeah. turns red, right? The problem is, I think, what you have in Overwatch is because it's so vertical, that might be awkward because then it comes from below, but there's your UI. So that's kind of strange. So they probably decided to put it around the crosshair and be done with it in that sense. And it also tells you how many shots... Come, are coming from that. In general, it's more information, but it f doesn't feel intuitive, and maybe it's it's not even an issue because once we learn, it might be a better option than what we have in CS:GO or something. But right now, it it's weird in a way. Would it be better if it <clears throat> was all around the edge of the screen? I think I might be misread remembering, but I think APUV had a system like that, I might be wrong, where it was all around the edge of the screen and it was fairly accurate where a shot was coming from and like how much damage you're taking. And I remember, it, if I'm remembering right, it feeling pretty intuitive. And then watching the streams, uh, it looks not intuitive what it has now. So you think it would be better around the edge of the screen? Yeah. The same display? 
But then again, I don't know if that's just learned behavior from decades of uh, FPS games, you know, the, being the most used method, uh, having the sc screen edges light up. But um, it might actually be, like, revolutionary in a sense, but it doesn't feel, because of the size also, it doesn't feel threatening in a, in a way. And hmm. logically, you would think, okay, your eyes are on your crosshair. I don't think that's 100% true either, most of the time. Like, you'd want to scan the field uh, outside oh, yeah. of your crosshair. If you don't see a direct threat, you're not, like, staring directly at your crosshair. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe that's, like, maybe, maybe I just don't know, and Blizzard actually looked at it with eye-tracking software or something. Um, but... To me, it didn't feel intuitive in a way, and that might down the road it might not be end up being a problem. But for the, I would say for a majority of players who get into the game, that will be an issue for the first couple of hours. Okay. Um, so we're talking about trying to take stuff away as far as some of the clutter goes on stuff that they've put on a little bit. What do you think about? So in Dota, at the top of the screen, obviously. They have, they don't want to put in an Overwatch like who's dead and who's alive. Like they they don't want to put in that that's on the score screen, but in Dota that's at the top of the screen. But what they put in after a while was alt markers. So if you're coordinating with your team and you you might have voice chat, but sometimes you might go in instinctively because you see someone with an alt. Do you think that they should add some type of indicator so that you know? that, you know, your Reinhardt has ult or your Tracer is, you know, has her ult or something like that. Like, your team ult indicators is what I'm trying to get at. I think they should add something like that, but under the caveat that they make it very small and make it, um, well, if you look at the game now, the character portraits, whenever you see a character portrait, it's the face, full color, um, huge, you know, as big as like a silver dollar on your screen. Um, if they make little tiny icons that represent those characters that you can learn that are intuitive, then that information could be helpful, I think, if they yeah. add that. To that point, I would say that there is currently a way to communicate that your ultimate is up, which is through the radial menu of uh, voice chat. You know, you have, can press, I think it's C, and then you can, uh, it's also in a pretty good position. It's like press C and then scroll mouse or go uh, go down with your mouse so it's pretty quick and you'd basically call the percentage of your ultimate yeah but then I mean, again that can just be trumped by say you're on voice chat so you don't need hmm. any of that my thing was just like the you know just the instinctual visual of having hmm. it because obviously hmm. if you're in a completely coordinated team you're always communicating what percentage you're at blah blah, blah. so this is more so for just pubs or the split second decisions of deciding if you're going to go in and talking or the the communication like you're saying the buttons that's seconds that you could have you know you missed your window which is it's theoretical but i just thought i'd throw it out there i think something that they should add along those lines is maybe or at least look at it is adding a visual indicator of when enemies have an alt like say you can look at a ryan hall Reinhardt and know if he's going to have an alt because um, I just watching some of the competitive play it's really tough and people just kind of like eventually kind of march in around the Reinhardt, Reinhardt and then he pops his alt and they all die um, I think if he had some sort of visual indicator they'd be a little bit more wary of his zone of control um, something I don't know I'd be interested in seeing I coming from like a MOBA background that is giving you so much information on the enemy mm. team that it ruins coordination for them. Yeah. So, like, yes, you can memorize cooldowns. I know it's not cooldowns for Overwatch, but for MOBAs, uh, you can memorize cooldowns. So you say, okay, he just used a huge ultimate. He has a minute or two left on the cooldown. Now we can act. Whereas for Overwatch, it's more so like, all right, Reinhardt just uses ultimate. He killed one or two of our guys. He's not going to have it up for maybe another minute or two because he has to recharge it. Now we can act. Whereas if you're saying for like a warning, like, oh, Reinhardt hasn't used his ultimate for a while, 
be weary. Do not crowd around him because he probably has it up. It's just more so like it's more so instinctual or not instinctual. It's more so like back to the coordination thing where it's like you got to think about what the enemy team has in their pockets. You can't just, you know, run in. I'm actually also very against displaying that because it lowers the instinctual uh, skill cap that players may, might have. Like currently, for instance, if you take the um, the recent tournament, European term, tournament, the winners of that tournament were so much better at filling up the ultimates right from the get go and getting an advantage out, out of that. The the enemy should be surprised by that. Their ability to load up their ultimates using different stra- strategies um, is a strategical and gameplay advantage that probably shouldn't be displayed. Or, like, you you should probably have a bigger advantage by being better at soaking it's, up it's the another, percentages. It's another skill that, like, comes with learning the game. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you know, but... Um... Oh, here's another one that I've heard a lot of complaints about. When you die during the kill cam and you're capturing a point or something like that, the kill cam resets or uh, rolls back the information displayed for you personally on how close you are to capturing that capture point. So, like, if if you're at, like, three-quarters of a circle and then you die, when you're showed the kill cam, rather than showing... Your team, you know, obviously because it's previous, it's not going to show your team still on the point almost capturing it or something. It's going to show when you only had half of the capture point, you know, uh, captured. Yeah, the thing is, um, for instance, I specifically saw saw, uh, Siegel is not watching any kill cam videos anymore. Because in his competitive mindset, that's giving him less of an advantage. He doesn't know where his teammates are. He doesn't know where the opponent is. Can you fast, like, just exit out of it right when it starts? You don't have to watch it? You don't have to watch it, no. But then again, should should that be an option for you? For the competitive player to turn it off? I would say, yeah. Because it's kind of like, it's nice to be like, oh, crap, I just got sniped. Where's that widow? But, I mean people on your team if they're watching you are going to be able to be like okay they're there she's in this general direction or you know something like that i don't think it's necessary for as far as competitive goes yeah and even if, if you think about it that's actually that makes it harder for instance someone kills you from a position you don't know where you've been killed from and then you can kill see, see the kill feed and this is something in other fps a lot of people keep complaining about like that kill feeds destroy, um, or kill cam in, in general, destroy certain plays, certain outsmarting plays, where you yeah. try to play with the opponent, but because there's kill cam, because now he has a second set of eyes to inform you, that destroys all the mind games that could be going on. Yeah, like, and I, I, No, go ahead. Just one, one point. I actually would go as far as to say that you shouldn't even be able to switch around your teammates. But you can do that in For competitive. CS. Yeah, and I don't. Th- yeah, I don't think that's that should be the case. The, so you, the so you in think super competitive mode, the screens should go black. Completely black for super competitive mode in tournaments and such. Yeah. Maybe not completely black. Maybe like scoreboard or stats or something or something. But yeah, that I think that'd be pretty interesting. Um, I always hated kill cams. They're fun in like a pub setting. Uh, see like how good so and so might be, but if you're the guy who who pulls off a nice flank and then gets away to a safe spot, you don't want that kill feed giving away your position. That's terrible. And even though you, you remarked that uh, Seagull isn't using it, he still has the option to. So say he is in a competitive setting, someone does jump him, and he doesn't know where he went. He does have the option to watch it, and that in that instance would be more. Uh, beneficial information than watching his teammates I guess and you'd probably opt for it the, the thing is let's let's just uh, define what we mean by that or what I mean by that that shouldn't be the case for pub games right I, I don't expect anyone to w- watch a black screen while he's dead that's obviously <laughs> stupid and very very unfun yeah yeah mm. 
it's mostly for competitive, you should have the option in a sense. And that's super hardline, and I can see that th this would probably not happen with uh, Blizzard, but at least, you know, the, uh, the replay of that play sh probably shouldn't be uh, available to the player who has just been killed in a competitive setting. Or you should be able to just disable it in a sense, yeah, where we, where we are uh, again at the customization of, uh, you know, the game to suit esports in a way. I or competition in general. I completely agree that kill cam shouldn't be a thing. I'm just trying to wrap my head around not even being able to watch your own dead body, because I can't think of a game that that is even a thing. What what uh, what do you mean by your dead body? Would you be able to if someone runs over you? Sh would you be able to see that then? Yeah, so it's it's a uh, it's a third person of your dead body, which doesn't move unless you got ragdolled, mm -hmm. and it's just you. Like you just watch your dead body for five seconds until you respawn. And obviously, it's not that big of a deal because in Counter Strike, you could die in the beginning of the match and be dead for a minute, and you could mm -hmm. gather a whole bunch of information. Whereas in Overwatch, you're dead for five seconds. So what does it matter that you're watching your dead body fly through the sky? Yeah. But I, yeah. I completely agree with the kill cam. It gives you extra information. It ruins tactical plays for those people who are hiding up top or, like, you know, they snuck in the back lines and it's a tracer. And you're like, where did that tracer come from? And you watch her. And especially <laughs> if, it, if it gives you a little bit more information after you died. So if you get killed by a tracer and then she rewinds you go okay well she just came from this corridor she's in there she just rewound yeah and so that's more information you can give to your team yeah yeah that's not, probably not healthy for competitive and then again it's it's always a trade-off because if it was so powerful then maybe Siegel would use it more too but uh, yeah I mean in general I would just ask for us to be given the option to turn it off if it would turn out to be a huge competitive advantage. Yeah. Um, but other than that, I guess the last thing as far as you, like yourself, playing first-person mode would be uh, the scoreboard. A lot of people are complaining that you don't see your whole team's kills, deaths, and that stuff. You don't see... Um, you can't compare yourself. Some guy wrote a huge post about, you know, finding people that you play with online and being like, all right, that's my rival and like finding a rival to compete against and like seeing that person in other pub matches or like comparing yourself to your other team so that you can get or to your other teammates so that you can get better and like, all right, I know I'm better than this person, blah, blah, blah. But in my opinion, coming from MOBAs and you know, CSGO and stuff like that, seeing the guy who's, I don't know, he's like five and five. He's not positive. He's just baseline, right? Five kills, five deaths. But he's defused the bomb ten times, or he's, you know, uh, he's cut down two or three towers by himself. But people don't look at that. People look at the KDA, and it's like that's the holy thing. Uh, I guess what's your what's your opinion on the score screen displaying kills, deaths, and that such? Um, I'm personally pretty for what they've developed right now. Uh, the game is a first-person shooter only in slight mechanics. It really is a team game, and the scoreboard should reflect that in some way. I believe, um, you know, even in TF2, it didn't reflect directly what was going on. I mean. <laughs> well, how can you represent um, what the medic does or the engineer specifically on the scoreboard? Um, it's it's tough. I think what they should do is find a different way other than metrics to represent that. And I think um, the community needs to get used to these different ways of representing that. One of the ways is, you know, play the game. But unfortunately, that seems to favor um, assault type classes, getting big whopping blast you know there should be something else for support something for like carrying the uh the cart across the the threshold or it should be about 
teleports. Mm. I don't know. Or like, um, play, I mean, like play of the game, Mercy reses all four people and they each get a kill or something. And it's like, it's Mercy's yeah. play. She's the one that made that happen. Yeah, she straight up won the match right there. But, you know, it's probably not going to show in the play of the game. There's also, you know, the voting. You can vote on on players. It seems to not be fleshed out enough to show the the wide v variety of stuff a player can do that benefits his team that isn't kills, you know. I do Damage like... blocked, that's kind of just one thing, you know. Reinhardt could do a whole bunch of other stuff, you know, just hold a corridor. How do you how do you put that into metrics and okay. put that in a game? Okay, know? by uh, by asking this question, question you actually activated my trap card because I've <laughs> I've given this a lot of thought in recent times and I actually planned a video on this, but Effort. I'm just going in here. So, the thing is, the first thing you have to realize in order to have meaningful metrics in uh, Overwatch is to understand what the objective of the game is. And currently, in the game, we have um, <clears throat> with the map types we have, it's all space based. What you're battling for is not kills, it's not a deathmatch. You're battling for space constantly. So, what you want to have in order to fairly judge contribution of a player is to judge how much space is he creating for his team. Okay? So basically, <clears throat> okay, this can, uh, can be obviously done by kills, but if you, if you go down the priority list of things that need to be done in order to win the game is you need to get on the node or get the payload in there. Okay, first objective. Second objective is to clear the space for your team to get in there. You can win the game by not simply not killing a single person, right? Yeah. Obviously, the best CC, we know this from WoW, is um, death. Yeah? Obviously. Yeah. So if you can kill people reliably, then <clears throat> um, obviously it's a huge plus. Because if you, if you would think of a list of the most powerful ultimates currently in the game, it would all be utility ultimates, probably with Mercy being uh, the first and Symmetra being the second. Why? Because she crea they create the ability for their uh, teammates to create a lot of space. They unlock, in certain situations, the ability for their uh, team to create space for them. So how do you judge that? Super difficult, right? Mm, that is difficult. And I, I saw actually a very, very good post on, um, <clears throat> on a subreddit, like not the main subreddit, but competitive Overwatch, where a guy had a very, very good proposal. And I hope I do, I'm doing him justice by explaining that. But basically, he sets up the map in different regions. So you have neutral, you have, um, the, which is like neutral value at that time. And then you have uh, offensive and uh, defensive, basically. And defensive being less valuable, I guess. And even then, it's hard to judge in that case. Because what currently ha is happening in the meta is you clean the enemy team of your node, if you're defense, for instance, and then you'd run to the next choke and try to capture that choke, right? Makes sense. Because chokes and Overwatch are so um, controllable because there's most of the time only two or three entrances, which you can just seal off on most maps, that valuing those will be insanely hard. Like, then you had to revalue the certain types, uh, certain regions you have in the map based on the situation in the game. So it's very, very hard to have a, a decent metric. That said, obviously, I also said it in his post, that's moaning on a very high level, right? Like, that's, even if that system is not optimal in the sense that, okay, this piece of the map right now doesn't have the value uh, that it should have, it's still better than kills and assists in a, in a way, or damage numbers even. Because if you think about it, dealing a lot of damage and not killing the others is actually detrimental to your team because now you're loading up the Mercy, now you're loading up their ultimates and not accomplishing anything. So as long as you don't, uh, you're not sure to kill them, you probably shouldn't even shoot, right? So, <clears throat> um, for, for this to be a success, that scoreboard, you have to take in, in, into account space. You have to take into account um, which abilities create space in a way and make it fair and then judge kills as maybe the second or, 
or third objective. Would right? would uh, lifespan be a metric? Like how long you've lived? Obviously, you know, someone who's AFK and lives the entire game doesn't count. But I'm saying if you're a tracer and you've been alive for the past five minutes, you have to be doing something good unless you're just running around in the backfield. Mm. But uh, do you know what I'm saying? Maybe you could combine life with um, the sort of zone that uh, Yiska's talking about. Like how many points you get for living this long in this zone with how many enemies. Yeah. Maybe something like that. I don't know. The, the thing this is, idea is pretty <clears throat> friggin' awesome, though. I'm liking what I'm hearing. Yeah, the thing is, what you need to realize is, in, a, in an FPS game with stats, there will always be people stats padding. And stats padding needs to be, ideally, the most effective playstyle to win the game. Because if you think about b Battlefield players, there's like this BF tracks thing, where they stand in a spawn, maybe with a vehicle, and just kill people all the time. And their points getting kept in, behind them, but they don't care. That's actually good for them. But because mm -hmm. now they have uh, more kills per minute, it ranks them higher. Stats padding really doesn't help them win uh, the game, in a sense. Th they win in their regard. It just makes them when look they, cool. Yeah, it makes them look cool, and it destroys the fun of their, uh, their teammates, right? Because you're not playing the objective, you're not playing to win. The, you know, the overall objective being to win, which we all ag agree on by joining the server, right? At least for comp competitive uh, yeah. game modes. We, we could talk about normals, that not being the case, okay? But, um, yeah, in that sense... So you're basically saying the, the screen has to be direct, like super directly related to success or defeat um, directly. Yeah. If there's anything that skirts around it like kills or KDA, it's going to incentivize KDA and not the victory or the defeat. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I just thought of I, something. What if, you know, I, I've seen, some, I can't remember what game, or I actually, have, I think they have it in like League and Dota where you can see the plot points on the map where kills have happened and such like that. So imagine the Overwatch map, and if your team has, you know, five players in the first zone, like just outside the first point, and if they have some type of graph or some metric to be like, uh, Team Blue was in this area of the map for so long, and they slowly pushed up, so it's almost like a meter is filling because they're pushing, they're attacking. So it's it's measuring by color base of like how long it took for them to push in, if that's what you're talking about, like the space. Mm. Like a heat map, you mean? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. But like is a heat map more so of how long they were in that area, and it's darker, obviously, for the longer they were in that. And so if the heat map goes on and it gets super light and then they push and they win, you know that they had that took them a long time to break that first point. But after they broke that first point, the rest of the map is pretty is pretty light in shade. So they won pretty fast after that. Mm. Then you could tie places of the game to that to that directly. You know, if it's a long front and then a Reinhardt does a charge that kills one guy but breaks through and gets them to retreat, that could be the play of the game based on, yeah. I guess, the heat map, you know, something yeah. like that. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Like, if you think about it, there's only three picks or four picks right now in competitive that are staples that you can't exchange, which is Reinhardt, Mercy, most of the time uh, Lucio, and McCree. Now you think, why Reinhardt? He doesn't kill a lot of people, obviously. He creates space and, s okay, this is a bad word to uh, call it, but safe space for, for his team. He, people can shoot through his shield, right, uh, the teammates. And because he's such a space creator, in a sense, that's what makes him strong. Not because of his kills, not even uh, what his abilities are, but his, especially his, his shield is a space creator for your team. And that's that makes him just the best tank probably right now. And yeah. he he has it constantly, right? Winston has it temporarily. Zarya doesn't create space unless she has her ult, really, really just by killing. 
Roadhog can create space by pushing people off. Probably the utility of his ultimate is better than the damage that is actually coming out. Because yeah. the damage is really not that high. It just but, creates a lot of chaos. Yeah, it creates chaos. You push people sometimes out of the point you're trying to capture without killing them. Right? It's an instant solution to, to, to the issue of space, in a sense. Yeah, Reinhardt just seems like he's he just pushes. He's just a wall that if he's not stopped, he's going to slowly squeeze you and push your back up against that wall while the rest of his team is coming in with him. And they're going to be the damage. He's going to be the pinner, which, I mean, that's what one of his moves does. Yeah. Or, or think of uh, D.Va. To the super competitive player, this is obviously rather easy to avoid being killed by a diva ultimate. But what it does is, if it's placed well, it's cr it creates this space where your team can now move into, s secure or fortify the position, because the, the enemy can't get in. If they, if they peek, they're dead because of the ultimate, right? And that's why she's also currently p picked a lot in competitive, not only because she creates space with her ultimate, with her ultimate but also bec because uh, she creates space with her um, sh shielding thing, you know? Yeah. So even, e. even though she's labeled as a tank, is she mainly played as like an assault dish or defense, I guess? Hmm. From what I've seen, she's played almost like a tracer. I don't play the game, but just from watching videos, she's almost like a persistent harasser, kind of. That's what I've seen her being played as. That, and sometimes she's like this burst of like, if you want to inject yourself into the position the, the enemy has, she does a very good job, just like Winston does in some instances. And then it really comes down to what is the character co composition of the uh, opponent team right now? And then you decide, is Winston better in this situation? And, or is uh, D.Va better? Because, for instance, if, if you know Farah's ult is up, D.Va is much better than Winston. Yeah. Farah just destroys uh, the, co uh, the um, you know, the bubble. Yeah, and uh, even if she doesn't destroy it, the the radius is not as big. If you think of how little the space is that she creates for a team, uh, that Winston creates for his team, it's not as big as Reinhardt ult could be, based on uh, not ult but also shield based on the position he takes. Okay, right. I think maybe we went out a bit of a tangent there. Yeah. Um, I want you. <laughs> uh, anything else as far as... So when I looked at the score screen, what I jotted down was uh, you personally. So people who are concerned about metrics of like, I need to know if I'm doing good this game. It displays personally kills, objective scores, final blows, deaths, accuracy, and then specific counters like Tracer. How many sticks did you get with your ult? How many people did you kill with your ult? Or, you know, stuff like that. I'm betting Mercy is like, how much healing you, did you do? How, mu how many people did you resurrect? So you can know your own stats. That's not a problem. It's just comparing them to other people for, you know, the people who need that EP in comparison. Yeah, but it, don't you think it's the nature of a competitive game to be comparing yourself to not only the opponent team, but yourself also to your teammates? And then... Obviously, you want objective metrics in that sense. I, I personally think, like, right now you don't really have any comparison other than the number you have. Like, for instance, you have top el eliminations. There's a uh, number one next to you, okay? But I think it's, it's kind of like th this competitive need that you have, um, that you want for co these types of games. You kind of need a scoreboard for that. And you need a scoreboard that really displays... Uh, actual performance right yeah i just mm. think that blizzard's really trying to cut down on just the toxicity of people which comes from being competitive it's the i'm better than you and you're gonna know it and that doesn't work well when you're trying to work together i think that you should be able to go back and review the game and get a whole heap load of stats just everything top to bottom things that we don't even know about that they keep control of how long you're on the payload how long you're on points stuff like that how much healing you did but displaying that stuff in the game while you're playing and you're like wow our 
you know, Lucio is he's died like five times and he's only gotten one kill and one assist or something. It's it creates that like give up mentality where my team's bad, I give up. And it's just not good, especially if they bring ranked into the game. Because obviously a, f- a six-man team is going to try to keep the camaraderie up. And pubs, it really doesn't matter to a certain extent. But when you bring ranked into the game where it's random people in a ranked game and they're all trying to win, if you've played any competitive game and you guys start to do poorly at all, people just break. People just break at the knees and give up. And if that information is on the screen for them to confirm that bias, I think that hurts. It, it hurts the game to some degree. I agree, but the absence of that, of any information or the absence of the ability to compare is also a problem. Uh, there's the problem of, you know, there's the heartbreaking stuff and there's also, you know, you could compare and like really wave your dick around in chat. That stuff is a problem, but the problem of not having anything is, I'm not sure if it's better or worse, but it's it's a problem that seems to be being voiced in the community right now. Mm. The, the absence thing, of comparison. The thing is, if you think about how uh, this worked for, out for other Blizzard games, like, I get this feeling that with in, in the last releases they had, like Hearthstone, then Heroes of the Storm, and now we don't know what the rank mode is going to be like for Overwatch, but they looked at StarCraft 2 and saw all these ladder anxiety threats popping up or opinions and just thought okay that that's a real issue and obviously our customer base is to a big degree uh, younger people who maybe can't deal with the pressure or are taking their satisfaction of uh, what every human wants in life from computer games yeah ideally obviously you should also take it from school yeah but an adult is probably not going to be um, that hurt because he gets satisfaction from his everyday life, right? And as an adult, you, I can't help but feel I'm being coddled in a way. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, yeah, it's <clears throat> that like, oh, don't worry, nobody's gonna be mean to you on the internet. As long as you're playing our game, nobody can, you know, they're not gonna yell bad things at you. But it's it's the fine line of being coddled and i mean you go google toxic players in league of legends and that game is literally like the breeding ground for people just shouting just the most profane things and i that's just the internet i guess but it's they tried to rein that in a little bit because they don't want to become the next toxic community yeah but that's two things does it matter in a in a game where you can just mute and the second thing is, should a gaming company care that much? Like, a reason for a company to care is if it's losing, losing their money, yeah. right? That's the only reason why. And I've yet to see statistics, and there have, have to be statistics, even like wealth budged recently by, uh, you know, shutting down the ability to talk to your opponents in voice chat in CSGO. Then you have... Uh, like Riot Games obviously actively pursuing a better com- community and you know with the um, ability to report and then reform cards and whatever. I think right? in Battlefront too you're not I think they said you can't talk to people in Battlefront. Okay. But that then there need to be metrics who basically st- which basically state they are losing money based on toxicity from other players and I can't imagine that is the case honestly. I don't I, it feels to me like an, a PR move in a way. Yeah. Yeah. Because especially for Overwatch, do you care that like the, the product you're currently saying? Obviously, you want to sell skins and everything, but the instant someone buys the game, you got it. You did your business. Now, okay, you're investing in uh, in a longer community. You do this by also supporting esports, obviously. So they want the game to uh, uh, to last a, lo- a while. I can see how they want people to stay in the community for a while, but I, I really want to see metrics how how this this toxicity really destroys people's confidence to play the game. 
Like I, I see these threads and everything, but we know that's mostly anecdotal evidence often. Like it, it's, it's hard to say if it's a real problem that people stop playing games because they're being bullied in them. That's almost a topic for another um, yeah. cast, I think. That's a, that's a big topic to talk about. What are mm. the implications of toxic shit? What brings it on? Like, um, and use examples of that. Um, I don't know if metrics like the traditional KD metrics and stuff would feed into toxicity. I think it's more of like a culture thing. Just yeah. intuitively, I feel like it's a culture thing that revolves around a game. Because StarCraft II, uh, there were those metrics. Um, even if you did 2v2s, you could compare directly to your 2v2 partner. You know, like how many pooled resources were you unspent and and no one really gave you crap for that. They were just pretty much pretty supportive, even opponents. You know, if someone cheesed you real hard or, or if you cheesed them real hard, it was generally not too bad. Uh, there was, of course, crap, but um, it was an okay community. Uh, I, think, I think it's just a community thing that develops over time around a game. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I mean, it's just, it's a weird move on Blizzard's part, but it's like the... Not talking to your opponents in Hearthstone and stuff like that. They're just, I guess, they're trying to, like you said, they're trying to, like, baby it because they want everyone to be included. That's why, I'm sorry, people can disagree all they want, but that's why World of Warcraft isn't hard anymore. That's why, you know, they just throw gear at you and they just, because they don't want the people who, I mean, they obviously want, you know, the basement dwellers that play for 18 hours a day and stuff like that. But they also want the dude who works 40 hours and wants to come home and play, you know, an hour of something to be able to get into it mm -hmm. without getting yelled at by a bunch of little kids. I, th I think a big reason uh, why Blizzard is taking this stance too is if you think back to your rating guild, if you played WoW, also for the viewers now, what, like, which people did you not like in your raid? And it's basically either you had, had a personal thing with them or... Because they were low on damage meters, right? Yeah. They were not performing. They were not pu pulling their weight. Not blaming anyone, but mostly older people not understanding their role or something, or how to optimize, or didn't care too much. And suddenly, you had a number that you could point out to people why they're not, not doing what they are supposed to, and you suddenly have created a reason to hate them in a sense. Where before you didn't really have an idea before damage meters what's going wrong. Now you have an obvious metric. Okay, he died so early, or he doesn't put out as much damage as he should be with his gear or something. There's also the flip side, which is not the negative side. Um, I can give an example for myself. And I played this game called DC Universe Online, and I would go on raids with people and. I played a pistol character, and one of the things a pistol character could do is spray the room and destroy all the knickknacks in the room, and that would count towards overall damage done. And I would play a, a, a support character with these guns, and people loved me, and I was the worst support character ever because they would look at that screen and they would see me topping the top do damage dealers because I was breaking knickknacks, and they just would look at that number. So yeah. it could go either way. It's, again, an example of how metrics don't yeah. <clears throat> translate so, to actual help and so people let me, taking it seriously. So let me ask the question, do we only want a scoreboard if that scoreboard is actually representative of, um, of the actual performance in the game? And then if it's not possible, if you find out that's too hard, should we just scrap the idea of a scoreboard or do we need one for a competitive game? Well, you need this. That's, you that's need the, the scoreboard for the other stuff that they aren't displaying. You need to know who's dead, who's alive, you need to measure some type of metric for yourself personally because, I mean, not that you shouldn't be knowing how everyone else is doing, but you need to measure yourself somehow. You can't just be like, okay, you know, go through the video and being like, all right, I got one kill there. All right, I got another kill there. There has to be some metric, but it's a, it's a weird line because... I, I don't know. It's it's to me killed. KDA is not everything at all. Like, mm -hmm. in having that metric there, there's especially in an objective. I mean, yeah, in a, in a team death match, whatever you you're gonna know want to know who died and who has thirty kills and hasn't died yet. But in an objective based game, 
it doesn't matter if you've died 400 times to an extent. If you win the game, you win the game. And yeah. it, it's, it, there's a line there. I guess to me, the absence of information, I guess, is probably slightly worse than having misleading or information that doesn't directly relate to an actual win or the the objective. I think I would rather have something that kind of doesn't make sense than nothing. At least you can kind of, for yourself, parse from the nonsense maybe something that makes sense. Um, you know, yeah, you could, t if you're a tracer and the other team's a tracer, as a tracer, you could kind of compare yourself to that tracer directly and maybe get some sort of meaning from that. Yeah. That would be better than nothing, I think. The, the thing is, maybe I'm alone in this, but if I play a round of CS and I'm bottom fragging one game and I feel I'm not pulling my weight, you can bet that at next game I'm going beast mode. Dude, I'm going to carry the next game because I'm so hyped up and feel so bad for uh, not, you know, carrying or helping my team that it will give more because now I know I'm not pulling my weight and that's a feeling like I would think that at least as many people who get discouraged by it get encouraged by it personally I go on tilt when that happens but <laughs> I can't get anything done yeah, it's po yeah. very possible but I guess I'm just trying to equate it to I mean in CSGO if you kill, you could literally not plant a bomb, and you could kill the entire enemy team every single round. That doesn't matter. The the objective technically doesn't matter in that game. Mm. Yeah. Whereas not in you know in Overwatch, if you kill the any t entire enemy team and not touch the payload, you lose. That happens well. so often. <laughs> like you, you you wipe the team and then they just push forward in a sense in a way that makes sense because then now you're secu securing the space, but nobody's pushing the card then. Like it's almost like nobody's uh, playing the objective, even in higher MMR sets sometimes. And that's comebacks to the whole thing where it's like if you display. I mean, this is very small amount of why, but if you display KDA, someone's gonna be like, guys, I have 400 kills. Uh, you should have been pushing the cart but you're a Reinhardt, and it's like, mm. no, dude, you should have been on the cart. And he's like, no, I have, I have the most kills. I've been doing the right thing. Yeah. So, I don't know. It's, it's kind of tug, a tug of war at this point. In the game uh, Planet Side 2, uh, for a long time they had, they didn't properly incentivize capturing points, and they incentivized spawn killing. And instead of killing the enemy you know, mobile spawn unit, people would just farm it and farm it, and puppies would just drop in, get farmed, and that's what people played because the money, it was money you directly earned in the game. It wasn't just points. You, you They gave you money for weapons and uh, and stuff and better uh, vehicle stuff. But they, start, they switched that and immediately the game changed. There was, you know, kill, kill the Sunderer because that's where the, the, the money is. Uh, don't farm the people popping out of it because you're going to get nothing. Or let's go capture some points tonight because... Um, you know, we're going to get some some coin for that, too. And it, it, it's definitely not fixed by, by a long shot. There's definitely farming in that game still, but it helped a lot. And I think if Overwatch looked at payment models, um, this kind of goes off track, but incentivized cart directly by giving the players a currency or something they can use in the game, I don't know. It might help people get on the cart. You're going the wrong It way. would have to be... You're going the wrong huh? way with this. Oh, you don't like the idea, or no, not in game, not for Overwatch. But I, I like you. Kind of secured and gave me more information to make a point here is that if we just get used to not having a KDA to compare ourselves to, and you use objective points, and if they get that metric correct, if we get you know healing done, damage done for assault people, damage taken for, uh, you know tanks, because that's how it is in Heroes. If you are a tank in Heroes or warrior in Heroes and you are taking the most damage, your score is displayed glowing your role. Like, it doesn't matter how much damage you've done as a tank. If you've taken enough damage, you are doing your job. So if they figure out a metric to just pull it all into uh, objective score. So for tanks, it's pushing the cart. How long did you sit on the cart? How much damage did you take? 
And for assault characters, it is those kills. It is lasting a long amount of time without dying. And for heroes or for healers, it's healing. And for Torbjorn, it's how long was your level three turret up, or how many kills did your turret get, stuff like that, or how many people used your teleporter as Symmetra. If they're able to get that, people will focus on the scoreboard, the thing that makes them go higher on the scoreboard. Because if kills are just not a thing, people are going to get used to that. Well, before the beta dropped, they had a scoreboard that they were kind of shopping around and mm -hmm. showing. And it'd be interesting to s see that come back and interesting to see what informed those points. It might be that Blizzard really had a system kind of close to what we're talking about, but um, they scrapped it. Um, maybe they should bring back what they had before the beta dropped. Yeah, and see I what mean, that does. It's only been a month. Anything that you know we see right now, by the by, 2016, it could be completely different. So, yeah, but, that's true. Uh, yeah. So that was that was an hour just for the first person. <laughs> um. <laughs> so unless anybody has some real big points, anything, nothing that, okay. Uh, so spectator mode, we've seen what two tournaments so far, and we three tournaments. Okay, three tournaments so far, and to me, obviously it's new. Obviously these people aren't you know professional Overwatch casters and stuff like that, but there's some things that definitely need change. Uh, for one, when you are looking in the spectator mode all along, let's see if I can do this on my cam, all along like the bottom, like right around here, there's little icons <laughs> of all the heroes, right? But if the spectator is also watching a first person to see how well the Widowmaker or the McCree is, is shooting, everything stacks on top of each other. So okay. you see the Overwatch heroes for all the teams, but you also see the health meters and damage and cooldown meters and stuff like that. It's all just like sandwiched together, and it looks gross. It looks mm. horrible. Mm. Yeah. I don't know if, I you, think if you notice that at all. I noticed that. I think something they might want to look into is a have the gameplay for a spectator have the option to have the gameplay, you know, shrink to, you know, like this portion of the screen, and then the rest is all the menu shit that they're gonna have to push. You know, like F one, F two, F three, F four. He's on fire. He has an alt, you know, and then have the caster, you know, just have like this section of the screen being captured. That way, the the viewer doesn't have um, just a giant clusterfuck of stuff happening. Yeah. Um, that would help. The, plus, they don't really need on fire logos. I don't think on fire is kind of neat, yeah. but I, yeah, it's yeah. Exactly. It, it's not needed, and it's big. And the yeah. uh, it goes back to the big character portraits and how there's no icons. You know, TF2 you had little icons, wrench. You know, medic. You know, the, like a you know uh, the bomb. cross. Yeah. 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 Bomb. You know, something like that would help for directly for something like this instead of like having Zarya's face with a giant flaming thing coming off of it. Yeah, and uh, I mean on fire basically does nothing in the game. That's just one thing you put into the UI. And for some classes it actually is a good metric how well you're doing. For some classes it's stupidly easy to have it. Like for instance for uh Zenyatta you are probably doing a bad job if you're not 80% of the game on fire. Basically, mm -hmm. because you s just stick it to a person. Like, most of the time, I, I, when I play Zen Zenyatta for an entire map, and on fire, being on fire is a metric that will be displayed as a card, I will always have, like, 90%, 92%, and the rest being just me walking from, from the spawn, right? <laughs> Unless I'm being flanked stupidly, uh, and don't react accordingly because of how his orbs work and how much contribution that seems to have towards um, being on fire it's not a good metric how well you're doing with the character right now well like someone like Winston I imagine would be really hard to get on fire because your job is to jump in and basically sacrifice yourself for momentary gain in area you know, yeah. and you're going to die <laughs> yeah most of the time uh, unless you can disengage but yeah I agree that the general theme of uh, Winston is to disrupt and most of the time die in the process. Yeah, at least if you're jumping, for instance, I, I'm thinking of uh, situations where it's like the last 
a little push for the payload, like Winston's going to sacrifice himself most of the time, jump yeah. in and. Um, so, yeah. so I guess it's another example of poor player feedback on actual performance, fire on fire. Yeah, but focusing yeah. focusing back on like the actual spectator stuff. <laughs> um, do you do you think that the spectator mode itself should be simplistic, like you are while you're in the game, or do you think that it should display cl more cleanly or whatever? Um, more information, because I know like in League of Legends, you have across the bottom, you have both teams, all their items, all that stuff, all the dragon kills, and then on both sides over here, you have uh, a list of the portraits, and then up top, you have like the timer and stuff, and then obviously in the middle, you have the game going on, and so there's all this like, it's not really cluttered, but it, there's a lot of stuff that you can take in, because obviously there's a little bit more going on in those games, but as far as Overwatch goes... Do you think it should just be a smooth, like, nothing's on the screen but maybe a couple, like, hero portraits? Or do you think it should display, like, um, a bunch of information? Well, first of all, I think the option of either or is best option. There's and gonna then be, second... There's going to be standard, though. Like, as far as we're talking from viewing on Twitch, like, tournaments. What do you want to mm -hmm. see on a tournament? Because if one person does okay. one thing and another person does another thing... One's going to stand out, and then it's just going to become the default. You have to do this option, or you look weird, or you like you don't fit okay. in. Okay. I guess I personally want more information, but it would have to be presented in a clean way. It cannot look like a 12-year-old's makeup, like the same like the uh, metaphor I made earlier. I mean, that's what it is now. It just looks like a mess. If it's clean, if it makes sense, and if it conveys the information in a way that doesn't you know, just make your head explode, then, um, yeah, I'd want that as a viewer. If if Blizzard wants to be smart about it, they give a lot of options, which we will be able to uh, customize our Observer client based on the needs that the meta is presenting right now. Because depending on the meta we will have, we have a faster game, we have different characters, We uh, may maybe there's... Uh, like currently you want to see if a Mercy ultimate is up be just because it's so strong. Maybe in the future that isn't the case. Maybe she phases out. Maybe W Lucio c becomes very uh, like the go-to thing. Like mm. if they want to solve this in one way, they just add the ability to customize. And to kind of uh, speak against the thing, even though from an uh, analytic standpoint, which I greatly enjoy, the thing is in League of Legends, I think the, the raw action is much easier to follow. And I f I, I'm feeling like if you clutter the screen with uh, statistics, unfiltered in a sense, even if it's d done well, it's it still, like, you don't want your audience to all be jet pilots who can, like, juggle three different meters at the same time while looking at the uh, play and then, you know, you... You want it to be presentable, and I, I think then less is more in a sense. And then let the, the broadcasters choose, oh, the, here's an outstanding metric. This uh, Widowmaker has 100% headshot uh, ratio or something, and then have that be able to inject into the screen or something. Well, for, um, Do for Dota, like exactly what you're saying, it'll be like, you know, um, for Alchemist, it'll be like uh, if he picks up a Hand of Midas, in, like, you get it in a pretty fast time. Uh, a tip will like almost pop up, almost like a score stat, and it'll be like 80% of the time when Alchemist picks up this item before 10 minutes, they win the game. And then it sits there for a couple seconds, and then it goes away. That's awesome. I so think. it's like little like mm -hmm. um, uh, statistics like over the entire history of like the patch or even just Dota mm -hmm. itself. In StarCraft 2, they you can have a whole bunch of information displayed, but usually the caster displays one piece relevant at a time. So, you know, early in the match, it's the food counter. And then a little bit later, it kind of talks about what upgrades are beginning to be worked on. So they pop that up. And then it would be the unit counter. And, then, uh, you know, if it's really slow, APM. Mm. You know, um, that way it's not all there just cluttering the screen. Yeah, yeah. I like, I like It's that. appropriate. It's appropriate to the instance that's happening in the game at that point. Because just th think about the sheer amount of information that is relevant to every situation, like HP of every character, ultimate status of every character, 
um, how many kills does he have or something. Yeah. So which player is on fire right now? Not in fire in the sense of uh, Blizzard's uh, metric system, but uh, in a li in a more literal sense, that like who's playing really well right now or something. Like this. And uh, I'm obviously forgetting a lot of uh, information that could be introduced there. You, you, like, depending on the situation and on the state the community is in, you want different information, and you mo maybe you want uh, different information for the type of tournament you're doing. Maybe you you're doing like a tournament with lesser players and want to just make it a, an easier time, or maybe you have dedicated streams for new uh, people, and you don't want to have one. You know, custom, uh, not, not custom, but one pre made thingy that you just botch over the screen where you just absolutely, um, you know, uh, overstrain the viewer in a sense that he has no ability to absorb the information. Because we had, the, we had a similar problem in, in WoW. The gameplay itself, in itself, was very, very hard to follow unless you were deeply into the WoW PvP community, right? Yeah. The, the reason why we had so many viewers was because the game was huge back then. It was the biggest game basically around. And then it conversed into a huge viewer base. But it was very hard to follow. It was very hard to display. It was almost impossible to display all the uh, relevant cooldowns in the situation. Like there were 20 second cooldowns like sp uh, counter spells or something that were very um, important in certain sh situations. Then you had um, like ice blocks or bubbles or something from for paladins which are very important in this situation and you want to display that at all times uh, as well as um, you know HP numbers and mana was also very important and then you want to see who's focusing who or something who's CC'd right now and it was like if you were playing arena some people who weren't uh, in the absolute top scene and who were able to uh, use mods their screens were Panels for Star Trek or something like they they weren't even really seeing their character. There was like a tiny thing where you, they could see their character, but the rest was was all metrics, basically telling them what to do. And they were, were play basically playing Axel at that point, yeah. right? And you don't want that. You want the the game is too confusing at its core to add too much information and to not overstrain people with the information. And you don't want to turn turn them off by doing that. And even just from, I mean, coming from League, why is it so big? It's because it's fun to watch. Even even for people who don't play the game, it's a huge spectator sport. So if you're going to have all these metrics all over the screen 100% of the time, I do think the small stuff that pops up, and you're specifically talking about different graphs and numbers and such, but if... If you clutter the screen so much that people are like, what is even going on? Then the people who don't play the game or like have thought about playing the game, and they're like, oh, what's this going on? It's on Twitch. It's on the front page. They're going to see it and go, eh, it looks real confusing for a shooting game. Because most shooting games are, I shoot, you, you die. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it has to be fun to watch rather than, you know, us or something being like oh wow look at all those numbers and all those statistics and stuff like that that guy's really good yeah it's also the the thing is in a sense uh, overwatch has no chill it's constant action there's no doubt time where a caster can hold your hand through this uh, the action um and it will take very very good casters to be able to uh to communicate what's being done at the moment. And we also need a meta game that supports it. Uh, we could talk about, uh, like we d did before, uh, about um, waves, wave spawning to uh, create these downtimes where casters can cannot catch up on the action. Um, there has been talks about uh, the system uh, Team Fortress has used. I don't know if you guys know about that, how they like I haven't hundred percently understood how they did it, but I think the stream was done with a delay, and then the cast kind of knew what was coming and were able to adjust to that or something. Hmm. But isn't isn't a delay it gonna break like the oh my gosh moments? Yeah, and it's it's kind of destroying offline play in a sense. Like that's where esports happens right now, right? 
we we want to be uh, at the offline big offline events and entertain crowds in that sense. Yeah. And I think inherently these oh shit moments, Overwatch has them. It has the overtime mechanic. It has the big ultimates that just wipe out entire uh, enemy teams. It has these comeback mechanics, or not mechanics, but comebacks are very real in this game. And these moments, the Overwatch can create these moments, but it's hard to tell the story behind them. I think that's excellently put. The, uh, the game itself has a lot working against it to parse the narrative out. Um, the, a lot of it's vertical. A lot of the rooms are closed off. There's going to be a lot of stuff a spectator just can't catch, like um, the tracer triple, triple blinking um, across the chasm to get behind someone to drop in behind them and kill them. He's not going to catch that because um, the maps are vertical. There's rooms that are cut off. Um, the action's fast. There's also the. It's always action, like you said. The without uh, wave spawning. It's always going to be someone shooting at someone, someone trying to push somewhere. Um, yeah, I, I think that was excellently put. You need a story to tell for it to be um, compelling to people or a narrative. And th there's just so much happening that doesn't make sense right now to the viewer without that, the tools to help make a narrative. Okay. Uh, focusing in a little bit more again. Uh, the third person and free cameras that we saw, like the almost like the flying the eagle the eagle eye cameras that we saw in the tournaments. I I really do like the third person cameras, but I've heard Vulture you talk about how can that doesn't display if you know a McCree like whipped his camera around and headshot somebody. It just to you it looks like he turned around and shot the guy. It doesn't give you that like precise that precise shot of wow this guy's really good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So exactly. where where's the balance in first person, third person, and the eagle eye views? Obviously, you're gonna need the eagle eye for the big ultimates and like the you know when the people, battlefield. Yeah, like the huge battles break out, and the third person can be used, you know, for like the the duels that happen in the background with two tracers or something. I think right now, probably why they use third person is I think first person. There's a problem with. Um, lag interpretation where I might be wrong but from what I've seen it looked like there's something wrong with the lag interpretation in, in first person view you'll be you know you'll be watching someone and they'll be shooting at a character here and the character model is over here and it dies and it makes the player look bad and it looks very very unsatisfying I think I might be wrong but that's what I've seen and unless I'm watching really bad players uh, who are missing by two whole um, character lengths when they're shooting stuff um i think it looks bad i think that's maybe something blizzard should look at and maybe then we go back to first person view but yeah i miss first person view i think is better for judging individual skill than like third person or camera view and you need that somewhere in the game somewhere in the narrative yeah because if you think do you think, think, do you think yeah. that sentry cameras will ever be a thing like uh, control, like, say they had to set up for, like, hotkeys, so, like, the number pad for the, the spectators. So you go, all right, they're pushing through this corner point, and there's a camera posted up or a camera spot posted up for the spectators in the point. So it's, like, you switch mm. to that point or, like, you know, oh, two tracers just ran into a room and they're one's trying to run away, and you switch to the hangar view or, like, you know, wherever they're running instead of, because I noticed it could just be camera, uh, like an adjuster, like the camera um, movement speed and like the breaking of the camera, like them stopping, push, moving their camera. But it seems like it was like janky, like they, you know, like they're I, moving their camera and it's like hard stops and it, it just kind of mm -hmm. takes away from that like cinematic flowing of like, you know, looking over the battlefield type thing. Uh, I have a few thoughts on this. First of all, moving cameras is bad for a spectator view, point of view. You should have standard, stationary cameras if that's what you're going to show. If you're going to show a battlefield, that sort of stuff, keep it stationary. And if that's the case, then make sentry cameras that you can hotkey to and set up yourself, even custom ones. Second, um, 
I think. Oh, I lost my thought. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, go ahead. I um, think I, I interrupted. Just go on. Um, uh, um, the thing is, uh, what I wanted to talk about is you need a good balance between first person and third person, or rather, overview. That is because if you think of every sport and every esport, it is driven not like people so obviously support teams, but it's about the big star players. These draw the masses, right? Yeah, There's this cult of personality. You you want to see, you, you want to know more about them. This is how you sell your brand too, like by introducing them into uh, or putting them into uh, any kind of uh, advertisement and stuff. And you need a, a way to both display that a team is uh, obviously a um, an important part. But that's, that isn't a selling or isn't the only selling point and probably not even the most uh, important for most people, right? So if you look at Twitter, for instance, I think Real Madrid, for instance, if I take a European example, doesn't have as many followers as Cristiano Ronaldo. Se seems fairly odd. He's a player of the team. But because he's such a superstar, he binds the masses, yeah. right? And you, you want these players to shine in these situations. You want to say, look at this player, he's doing these things and this is how he changed the situation and the team I think in order to uh, be success a successful eSport has actually to be the second thing that is uh, supported. Obviously people support teams, yeah, but they pick, they, they seem to more so in eSports because it's closer, you watch their streams, you know what their person uh, personalities like people follow personalities around. If they switch a team, suddenly they're favor uh, fans of the other team. Yeah, it's right? the it's the dendies and the double lifts and like the people who are the because there are people who are yeah they're good they're just really shy and not that people. But it's the people who are making the plays and it's the star players and it's you know the guys who stand out at being so good that people are like oh I like curse because X player is so good. But like you said, if that player gets drafted to another team, some people are like, oh, well, uh, I, I guess I like Liquid now. Mm. And it's it's those people. Yeah, it's the star yeah. players rather than, oh, hey, that team's pretty good. They win a lot, but they don't have any standout players. Yeah. If you think about um, the best or some of the best uh, CSGO teams right now, it's mostly that, uh, like, even the more successful teams that have a better team performance and regularly plays better. For instance, your NA scene is the best example for this. Yeah. So you have L Luminosity, which, fair enough, is, isn't actually an A team, but they compete there and everything. Uh, they are from Brazil. And they are all about, uh, they used to be all about uh, team play, had very, very w well crafted tactics and were able to beat the top European teams and but the, somehow they never got the me media or the fan attention as pl players from Cloud9 who are individually very skilled but somehow sometimes it did, just didn't click. Their strategies weren't on, uh, like on the level of luminosity. They are never not even close ex to ex uh, not even close uh, as successful as um, uh, luminosity is, but still their fan base is huge because they are made of, of a team of fan favorites and sort of, even if they weren't before, now they are because uh, Cloud9 is very good at uh, pr promoting their players uh, on, from an individual perspective. It's not that much about team performance. You have to have you have to have a system that promotes star players in a sense, and then following will come for the esports scene. So is what, my opinion. Of so that. what do you think is important to display in a first-person perspective on spectators? Because, like, because what they do right now is just as if you were playing that character. Do you know what I mean? You're mm -hmm. getting the exact UI as you would if you were in-game. Is any of that... Well, you don't I, get hit markers. You don't get hit markers. That's one thing they don't do that they should do. Yeah. I think you Sorry. you should you should have this very same uh, UI you you get in first person, and then obviously if you think about it now, there's Tracer and Genji players 
are perfectly set up for this. Like, I can almost guarantee that the most like famous player will be the best tracer or Genji player yeah. when the game gets popular, because they have the highest skill play uh, cap. Their kills look flashy, right? And um, there's uh, lots of impressive play to be had. It's not going to be a Reinhardt player. I know that much. Even though he might be the best player in the world, the most impactful in any sense, best team player maybe, but the best players will be uh, Genji and Tracer, and following them around and showing the skill of these characters will be a challenge uh, we have to solve in some way. Okay. Um... What about, okay, so we talked about we're obviously equating this game to CSGO a lot because CSGO is a very popular FPS, which FPSs seem like they're hard to follow as far as tournaments go, but for whatever reason, CSGO has done it. Um, one thing that I noticed that CSGO does is they fill up the character portrait, or not portrait, I'm sorry, the character outline. So you can wall hack, in a sense, in spectator mode so you're able to see everybody everybody what's going on so you can jump to people or you know run through a wall with the free cam but if somebody gets shot their health fills up or their body fills up full of blood almost and i looked at this in the spectator for overwatch and i watched a roadhog get lit up tuck around the corner and then get lit up some more and he died but i had no indication that he was at half health as a spectator mm. So mm -hmm. you have two choices. You have either a health bar above their head, which looks tacky in some senses, or you have the CSGO route, which is the outline, which they already have in Overwatch, but then you fill it up with the team color or, you know, whatever of how much damage they've taken. Is that mm. something that you'd like that you think would transfer well? I think so, yeah. <laughs> Um, one to one, it it would transfer great. I think it's a great mechanic. Yeah, and then then I like knowing Blizzard uh, about their visuals. They might not find that very pretty, in a sense, you know. Mm. And um, but but I mean, I think there's options for innovation in that sense. Like you could you could imagine a world where the maybe the color changes or the the outline gets bigger or something you could still be able to see the character model or something mm, that, i'm not sure if we only have to, these two options but rather if there's some clever way to display it that feels intuitive and um helps the viewer understand that this person is in danger right now yeah something. because if you have a tracer who gets lit up or something and barely escapes with her blinks you have no way of knowing if she got lit up or she just happened to run through and the other person just threw their mouse against the wall and didn't hit anything. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, I think, like, UI designers are up to the task in that sense. And I think there's a lot of room for innovation to be had. It, we, it's, it's just important that we point out that this is, this is very important for us to know. Like, this is... Uh, uh, yeah. about uh, entertainment value, you know, he just managed to uh, kill the other person with three HP left and it's so close and it hinges, like the entire play hinges on that this uh, exchange, for instance. It, it happens that you survive with three HP and cap the point, right? Mm -hmm. this, is, this is amazing information to know how close it was, right? So that's, uh, it probably needs to be told in some way. Yeah. And not it would feel lame if, if if after the fact the caster goes like and by the way he had three HP that like that wouldn't create the same hype. No. In a sense. Do you think it's something that Blizzard's gonna focus on, these sort of um changes to the spectator experience? Dur during the beta, I should say? If mm. if I know Blizzard how I I think I know them, it's they like community feedback. They obviously have taken a bunch of things that the community has put together being like, we need this. But Blizzard is also very stubborn in the fact that they're like, okay, you want that? Well, we're going to kind of give you that, but add our own flavor to it. So hmm. it's kind of like we just need to shove them in the right direction and hopefully they find the door. 
I personally find it very encouraging that they have repeatedly said that they are looking at not just their own forums, but also Reddit, they, that they have dedicated people uh, looking at the feedback uh, they get from the community. And like one thing they won't be able to say is that we didn't tell them, right? Like, like just not us, but obviously the, the entire subreddit, if you want to talk about that, all the community sites and everything, these concerns ha have been voiced, right? Uh, mm -hmm. in, in a sense, not with real solutions or very in-depth maybe, but a general feeling of, okay, this is not causing this what I, what I want from the game. Yeah, this, I think this has been uh, accurate, accurately voiced by the community so far. And then again, six months sounds like much. Depending on what they're doing, I personally, I, I don't think much is going to... Like, the Observer client will have a makeover, like the, the bug we uh, talked about where it overlays kind of like the, the on-fire thing, that's going to be gone. That's, I don't yeah. think like Blizzard yeah. is going to dish out an uh, unfinished product. But if all these changes we need for it to be super or the best it can be in the esports sense from what we know about the game right now, I, I'm not sure it's going to be there at launch. I don't think it'll be there at launch either. I think maybe it'll, it won't be terrible. Like you said, they'll remove the whole on fire thing and um, maybe they'll set up some stationary cameras um, but for the most part, I think if they do decide to develop a very good and uh, solid spectator experience, it's going to be maybe a year after launch or maybe even longer. Uh, the amount of work that's going to need to be done for all the little things is pretty immense for it to be done in six months. Yeah, and if... knowing Blizzard, they like perfection in their stuff, and they, they're not going to build this big spectator system and then, like, poop it out a month before launch and like say it's done and it's complete because they're not like that no and that's with i mean this kind of goes along with i hate the people who are like you know let us just play the game it's early access blah, blah blah no it's blizzard guys you have to understand they're not just gonna be like you know what that's a good idea let me put out a very <laughs> rough sketch of this yeah. they're gonna be like hey remember that thing you told us a year ago to do yeah we've been like polishing it for the last six months <laughs> Here it is. Yeah. And, and this is just like the the big topic in uh, in gaming right now is the, all these um what's it called uh, uh access what's it called again early, uh, early access early access this is never going to happen with blizzards no. blizzard right this yeah saying it right now this is never going to happen with the blizzards they might ask for the money you know in advance like pre-order that right now and yeah, not even give any incentives. By the way, pre-ordering video games, you don't know how they will turn out. is pretty stupid. Um, but uh, these unfinished products, we cannot uh, expect from uh, Blizzard, and that's good, right? That's, that's how it should be. That's a whole other discussion of, like, money grabbers and stuff like that, you know what I mean? But I'm happy with the way that Blizzard produces things. It's just... It's just hard to stare at that, you know, steak sitting over there on the table, but you can't eat it yet, man. It'll be it'll be there once it's ready. But, you know, it's a lot of people just have a tough time staring at it. I always get the steak, man. Yeah, you're already you're already <laughs> eating the steak and we're over here waiting in line, man. Yeah. Um, it's but, quite nice. Okay. Uh, Medium rare. <laughs> Is there anything else that you think the tournament, as far as, like, spectator stuff, needs? Like, is there something that stands out to you that's, like, they need to have this or it's going to fail? I Do think you... uh, no. just for the a simple point about camera controls, right now the camera seems to have no elevation control. So you fly it like an airplane, which is, like, terrible. It is absolutely friggin' terrible. So you have to, um, like, look directly up to go up yeah, vertically? Yeah. You look up, and then you go up, and then you point it down. It needs more helicopter-like controls. That's <laughs> the one point I can make about that. Is it? I'm not 100% sure. Like, normally you would think, okay, let's just take the Farah model, make her invisible, and give her an infinity boost or something. Shouldn't be too hard to do, right? Like, is it really that they have to look up in order to get up? 
or is it that you can kind of like with a space bar travel um, logically? I'm not sure. I'm not paying attention to that. I don't have access to it, uh, but from what I've seen, the the casters they fly the camera like an airplane, and okay. or what they'll do is they'll kind of like they'll point it backwards and then use you know S on the keyboard to kind of like oh, yeah. butt bounce back up that oh, yeah. way. Okay, but you can't just have it go up like this like a helicopter yeah from what i've seen I mean, maybe you can like, maybe they're not using it right i don't know yeah that's weird because you could even i mean it's a completely different engine but that's how you could fly mounts and wow you could just hold space and you just go up you know what i'm saying yeah mm. um but other than camera controls we covered that we covered in-game mod or in-game stuff uh quick little side thing that i just thought of what do you guys think about the whole skin buying with I mean you, uh, technically you can't see your own skin and that's part of the UI that's why I'm bringing it up hmm well you could have the uh, you know the weapon and everything skinned in a sense I guess then you also have emotes where you see your own skin or but... you know, like you look cooler to other people I guess yeah, yeah. Obviously, let's not kid ourselves. Nobody's <laughs> like it's prestige. Obviously, like people buy stuff, expensive stuff, ultimate skins in uh, in league to say, okay, I'm willing to spend this kind of money on a celestial steed or something. Yeah. Oh, oh, that tracer in that costume killed me again. I remember him. Like that's the sort of thing I would be shooting for um, for buying it. I wouldn't want to see. I wouldn't really care what I look like, like yeah. if I can see it in game. Okay. Uh, other than that, let's uh, custom UI. I know we dabbled on this a bit in both with the sizing and scaling and all this other stuff and the co the you know the text and stuff like that. Is there anything you have to say as far as custom UIs? Will I hope add-ons do not become a thing. Not add-ons in the sense of wow, where they're tracking stuff for you, but like. Custom crosshairs, c different colors for, say, your health bars or, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, different colors and stuff for, like, your cooldowns and stuff like that. Is something is that, is that necessary or just, like, cool flair? I believe it's necessary today to have it. Um, there's so many different types of players. This game is not a first p FPS. It's not a MOBA. It's not anything that's specifically one thing. So it's drawing a whole bunch of audience with a whole bunch of different games under their belt. So they should really open it up instead of just giving them one plate of just this is what you get. This is the game. Um, some people are not going to be happy with it. Some people are going to be very unhappy with it. Some are going to be very pleased with it. It would be best and I think pretty, um, pretty mandatory considering the type of game it is and the draw to to open it up, give you as many options as possible. Yeah. I think if you think about the gaming community, the, the uh, FPS community is sort of like the Android user that wants to be able to have all these customizations and uh, the settings and not just buy this one thing, this iPhone or something, where you can't change a lot. Like, the FPS player is like, okay, yeah. let's... Let's tinker with our crosshair a little bit, and then I change my crosshair, and now I'm playing better, placebo effects and everything, and then, um, I don't know, like, oh, my input rate, and, like, this gets v almost scientific at some point, right? Mm. If, you, if you look at the uh, separated last couple of days, explaining netcode, how, how the tick rate, everything, which is a whole different topic, but just from a... Um, from a customization and uh, like how much we look at details in FPS. Like I remember um, being at uh, Hanover at CBIT and I was watching Rafa play and his FPS dropped from 300 to 260 and he was like, admin, this get PC is lagging. 40 FPS at 300, right? Like, but uh, yeah. For we, FPS players want customization, and it's a real concern, and they actually feel the difference, yeah. I think. Mm. I, mean, I, I could say, just for myself, I like to, just to change the color on the uh, crosshairs, because 
most of the time a white crosshair isn't going to cut it because there's white all over maps. There's white characters. There's white particles. Um, I want high or like highway cone orange um, crosshairs for my just for that one reason. And um, I know a lot of other people. I don't know if you can do anything about it, but your camera just went oh, blurry. Sorry. Okay. There you ah, go. I'll there you go. go. Okay. You were saying, Vulture? Yeah, for me, I like to change the color of my crosshairs just so I can see it better because most every single game, a standard crosshair color is white or it's another color that doesn't stand out, and then you're going to lose it. And it's it feels great having a, a crosshair that you can see easily and track easily amongst all the visual clutter in a game. Yeah, even mm. if it's not like that important, it is nice to have... It's it's your UI. Like you feel comfortable using it. Yeah. I mean, on on our list, on our Christmas wish list, this wouldn't be the first spot, right? No. We, like the the UI thingies, like which we no, said it would about be visual beta access. Yeah. No shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Maybe a second account would be decent. <laughs> no, I don't have that. I don't have a couple accounts, you know, hooked up. Um. But something I just thought about that I saw a post about today was the bloom effects from, like, the sun and stuff. And people are complaining that, uh, you know, the sun on a certain map actually blocks out. Like, if you look up in the sky and a pharaoh could be up there, but because the sun is coming down, you can't see her. So how far, you know, how far should these settings go to where you're turning off everything that Blizzard put in the game to get the max capacity of like competitive edge. That might even be a, a whole other subject because there's a whole other video because there's a, there's um a wealth of games to draw on for examples for that, but just for the purpose of this, I'd say just it like depends. a short, you know, yeah. statement. I guess I'd say it depends on the game. Some games do have this uh, you know, sun effect uh Overwatch isn't the only one. And personally, I kind of think it's kind of neat having it as a strategy, but with the caveat that you can't turn it off on low settings. Then it's not fair. But that's my initial thoughts on it. Okay. Anything uh, anything jumping out on you you forgot to say before we uh, start wrapping this up? Mm, no. No. No mouse wheels turning? All right. So that was our basic thought, you guys, on the UI for Overwatch. Obviously, we went off on a few tangents and stuff like that. There's a lot that we missed probably and a lot of things that people are concerned about. But uh, I think that we covered most of the basics. Maybe not basics. Maybe a little bit further than basics. But other than that, I think that about wraps it up. That's almost going to double our length of the last video, by the way. Uh, but there's a lot to be said about this topic there might be shorter topics there might be even longer topics for when the game actually comes out and such but uh yeah so i'm gonna go ahead and plug myself so i have been trips and you can catch me over on my twitter at trips dota unfortunately i'm not able to drop the dota tag so you know let's stick with it same thing on youtube trips dota and i've been streaming more getting ready for that overwatch access that i know is coming uh, over on Twitch, it's just trips. The Dota's not there. I actually watched you playing CS. And don't, don't. I wonder if that invite isn't wasted on you. <laughs> Based on what I was. <laughs> <laughs> nah, just kidding. But it was actually decent. Just yeah. don't buy uh, six anymore. Hey. Um, <laughs> I do what I want. I'm not. I'm not. I don't. I don't admit to being a good CS:GO player. Yeah. Uh, no, but yeah, go ahead, Yiska. What you got going on as far as uh, any videos or you know, what are you doing? Yeah. Well, first, uh, let me plug my Twitter, which is at Yiska Out, where I post uh, a couple of thoughts I have about Overwatch. Uh, if I didn't suck this badly at Photoshop, at making an overlay, which I've been working on about seven hours and it looks awful, um, I would probably have put out some video at some point and it's a plan of mine to do that um, let's see how long that will take but uh, yeah so far it's just uh, Yiska out and on Twitter okay and Voltra you got anything special going on right now 
Uh, you can find me on uh, Twitch. I stream sometimes. Uh, Vulture with the underscore. Uh, I'm not streaming too much right now because I'm having trouble finding stuff. I want to stream. But I think I'll be picking it up when pretty it soon. Yes, when Overwatch comes out, I'm gonna be I'm gonna be on the internet forever. I'm just gonna live here, right right here on this screen. You're gonna <laughs> see me the whole time. So uh, when Overwatch comes out, look for me. And uh, if you want to see me beforehand, I stream little indie games just for fun. I stream some Brawlhalla, some Infinity Wars, um, sometimes Planet Side, sometimes other other stuff, but not too much. And that's it. All right, guys. Well, from everybody here at Watchpoint, thank you again for watching our uh, our little cast and listening to our discussions. If you had anything to comment on, whether it was in the first 30 seconds or the last 30 seconds of the video, uh, be sure to make a comment, start a discussion, you know, get people going because it only takes one to get an argument started. And uh, we will see you guys on the next video, whatever that topic may be. And good luck in getting into beta. Peace out, guys.